So as we continue in Acts chapter 13, we come now to verse 13 of the chapter. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. So after leaving Cyprus, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga, and when they arrived, it mentioned John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. We're not told the reason for this here, but later in Acts chapter 15, we're told that he deserted them and had not gone with them to the work. So they were evidently anticipating the help of John Mark on the rest of their journey, but because he left them here, went back to Jerusalem, they were going to have to do without. So Paul and Barnabas did not stay in Perga. Instead, they traveled to Antioch of Pisidia and visited the local synagogue on the Sabbath. After the reading from the law, the synagogue officials provided an opportunity for Paul and Barnabas to offer any word of exhortation for the people. So Paul quickly stood up and took advantage of this opportunity. So verse 16, Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. For a period of about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. So Paul began speaking by giving a brief history of the Jewish people from their time in Egyptian bondage all the way to the time of Jesus. He reminded them that God chose their fathers to be his special people. And after they grew in strength in Egypt, God led them out of slavery. Yet because of their unfaithfulness, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years while God put up with them as they were tempting him throughout that time in the wilderness. After 40 years, when the next generation rose up, he led them into the promised land where God destroyed seven nations and distributed their land as an inheritance. Then Paul briefly mentioned the period of the judges, concluding with the prophet Samuel. And during his days, the days of Samuel, the Israelites asked for a king, which was a rejection of God as their king, as 1 Samuel 8 and verse 7 says. But Saul ruled over the nation, but he was not faithful to God. So God removed him. And after that, he raised up David to be their king. And though David was not perfect, God described him as a man after my heart who will do my will. Then verse 23, from the descendants of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. After John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. So rather than continuing with the history of the Jewish people, Paul transitioned to talk about Jesus. And after mentioning David, he said that through the descendants of this man, God brought a savior to Israel, who was Jesus. He described the teachings of John the Baptist, which was evidently known to the Jews in this place, not just the region where John had preached, and how he had pointed to Jesus. Then verse 26, Brethren, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him 
nor the utterance of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. When they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. So Paul then declared that the message of this salvation had been sent to them. However, as he mentions here, Jesus was not recognized as the Savior by those in Jerusalem, even though, as he said, they had read the prophecies in the synagogue every Sabbath. Yet their rejection of Jesus ended up fulfilling the prophecies concerning him when they condemned him. And even though he was innocent, they compelled Pilate to have him executed. And in all of this, they were inadvertently carrying out all that was written concerning him. They rejected him as the Savior. And by opposing him and having him put to death, they were helping to fulfill the prophecies that proved that he was the Savior. So we continue in verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children, in that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. So even though those who rejected Jesus had him put to death, God raised him from the dead, and after he was raised from the dead, he appeared to the apostles and others who were now his witnesses. And Paul said that this was the foundation of his message. The good news of the promise made to the fathers was based upon the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, who, as he quoted from the second psalm, is the only begotten Son of God. Verse 34, as for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. So Paul says that after Jesus was raised from the dead, he would not undergo decay, meaning that he would not face death again. And Paul said this was a fulfillment of the holy and sure blessings of David. And he cited the prophecy from the Psalms that you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. This was also quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 and verse 27. But though David was faithful to God and received promises from him, he had not been raised from the dead. This was not talking about him. Paul said that he was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. Yet this did not happen to Jesus. These prophecies pointed to him. So then verse 38. Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through him everyone who believes is freed from all things, from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Therefore take heed, so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel, and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. So Paul then brings his message to a conclusion. Because Jesus was sent as a Savior and has been raised from the dead, his apostles were able to proclaim forgiveness of sins through him. So Paul then explained that the resurrection of Jesus made him superior to the law of Moses. He said that through Jesus, everyone who believes is freed from all things, but they could not be freed through the law of Moses. The law of Moses could not free them from sin because the sacrifices of the law could not take away sin, which is stated in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. For it is impossible 
for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So after warning them of the rulers and inhabitants of Jerusalem rejecting Jesus and unwittingly fulfilling the prophecies about him, Paul warned these individuals not to reject the message of the gospel and fulfill another prophecy themselves, that they would scoff at what God was accomplishing in their days and refuse to believe it. So now let's notice what the reaction was to Paul's message here in the synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia. Verse 42, as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. But they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So the initial reaction to Paul's preaching in Antioch of Pisidia was very positive. The people were eager to hear his message again, and they were begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. However, some of them were not content to wait another week to hear more from him. And it says many of the Jews and the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. And as Paul and Barnabas spoke to them, they were urging them to continue in the grace of God, which is another way of encouraging them to seek after the Savior who was foretold about in the Old Testament that Paul had been proclaiming to them. Now, when the next Sabbath came, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. Unfortunately, the Jews were filled with jealousy over the popularity of Paul and Barnabas. And their response was much like the reaction of the rulers in Jerusalem to the apostles' teaching, as they tried to do all they could to stop it. We studied about that in Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5. However, they could not oppose the message that Paul was preaching without contradicting the will of God. So in contradicting the things spoken by Paul, they ended up blaspheming against God. So in response, Paul and Barnabas told them that it was necessary for the gospel to come to them first. But since they repudiated it or rejected it and judged themselves unworthy of it, they were going to turn to the Gentiles. However, this was also part of God's plan. And Paul cited the prophet Isaiah to show his intention to bring salvation to the Gentiles. And, not surprisingly, this led the Gentiles to begin rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and many of them believed. A few verses later, they were called disciples, as we read in verse 52. So we know that their belief led them to do what others had done in response to the gospel as we've studied so far in the book of Acts. They turned from their sins. They were baptized to have their sins washed away. They became disciples. That's where their belief led them. And as verse 49 says, as this was going on, the word kept spreading throughout the whole region. However, the Jews who were jealous over the attention the crowds were giving to Paul and Barnabas, they started to stir up trouble against them. They incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against them and drove them out of the district. 
However, this was not a defeat of the gospel. The disciples in that place were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And Paul and Barnabas simply shook the dust off of their feet and moved on to the next city. The next chapter will pick up with their preaching in that city of Iconium. And as we will see, the response they received in Antioch of Pisidia was fairly characteristic of the response they would get in every city they traveled. Some were eager to hear the gospel and begin following Christ, while others were vehemently opposed to their teaching and did whatever they could to turn others away from the truth. 